The Yurdigo is a podcast channel is brought to you by First Nations Fiber. Hey everyone, welcome to The Lead, where we discuss the news and events happening in the community of Gunawage. In this special episode, we discuss the controversial Bill 96 and how it will affect education, healthcare, and Gunawage Ronu. Have you ever been gaming or working online classes and your internet service constantly gets interrupted? First Nations Fiber is about to ensure that just won't happen again. Get ready for high speed at a new level. Click on fnfiber.com and sign up today. First Nations Fiber, empowering people through connectivity. Hey everyone, my name is Jordan Standup. I'm the assistant editor here at Yerdiwaze, and today I'm joined by our editor and publisher, Greg Horn, as well as our contributing writer, Mark Lalone. So welcome to the studio today, gentlemen. Hello, hello. Greetings. How are you today, Jordan? I'm doing very well. How about you? I am doing wonderful. The weather is nice. It's June. Life is good. I have these gentlemen here in the studio today so that we could talk about the controversial Bill 96, which, of course, has been on just about the tip of everybody's tongue as of late. And to start this off, I would like to throw this over to our editor, who's been writing extensively about Bill 96 for the past several weeks or actually months, I would rather say. So, Greg, uh, could you start us off a little bit talking about Bill 96? So, Bill 96 has recently passed the Quebec National Assembly to, to go from a bill to a law. It was first introduced by the CAQ government a year ago, and it kind of flew under the radar. It was in the middle of the pandemic. People didn't really look at the contents of it, and it was touted as a bill that would uh, further strengthen the French language, which for some reason the Quebec government is deeming endangered when there's still millions of people in the province that speak French, but I digress. I think a lot of the things was that people were were looking at it. Once they started looking at the nuts and bolts of it, it's a 200 page or so law that is an amendment or it amends Bill 101, which is also known as the Charter of the French Language. And it gives sweeping powers to the Office Québécoise de la langue française, or who are better known as the Quebec Language Police. Any business, registered business in the province, more than 25 employees is now subject to the provisions of Bill 96 and and Bill 101, which means that a business over 25 people is required to conduct all its internal communications in French. And it gives the French language police the powers to monitor and seize work phones computers, read text messages and emails to ensure compliance. So that's a huge red flag. Police have that power, but they have to go to a judge and get a warrant. And there has has to be a legitimate reason. And, you know, making sure that somebody's writing and expressing themselves in French is 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 not a good legal reason to do so. Uh, So there's there's a lot of different things. And, And one of the things that I think really caught the eye of the community is that there's a provision to initially it was to add core courses for students at English CGIPS to have core three core courses done in French, which is a huge undertaking for those people who are not francophone. And it would it, it would make their lives a little bit more difficult and, and make it more difficult for them to get into university. And then there's also other concerns with access to justice services in the language of your choice. The access to healthcare in the language of your choice. Of course, there's carve outs for continued service in English, but those are for people who are considered under the the law, quote unquote, historic Anglophones. And in order to to prove yourself as as one of these historic Anglophones and therefore able to get services in, in English, you have to have had a permit to attend school in Quebec in English under Bill 101. And as many people know here in Kahnawake, nobody has those permits. So, I mean, that, that's just some of the things that people are are concerned with about, about this piece of legislation. And there's been a lot of discussions over the last uh, few weeks in the community with some impromptu public meetings being called, uh, some community members taking to the streets and, uh, and, and doing traffic slowdowns and trying to raise awareness and to show the outside that we're against this bill for various reasons and, and we're not the only ones. So this is something that I think it, it affects more than just going to log in and, and people really need to, to stand up and take notice. I'm glad that you brought that up, Greg, about, you know, some of the actions that are taking place here in the community, because uh, as you were just mentioning, our local students actually uh, spearheaded one of those uh, demonstrations that you actually covered. 
Yeah, this was a, a few weeks ago. There was a public meeting held on a Monday evening to talk about this. And then the following morning, uh, the students at the Ganong Survival School organized a walkout and the entire community, all the community organizations were all encouraged to to attend and, sh- and so- show support. At the end of it, there, you know, there was probably the entire student body of the community, along with uh, parents and the average everyday community member going out in sport. I believe there was, uh, you know, between 800 and 1,000 people who took to Highway 132 and did a traffic slowdown and walked from KSS to the green space at the foot of the Mercier Bridge. And normally uh, something like that takes, uh, you know, 15, 20 minutes, uh, you know, in, in, in previous years. And and because of the, the sheer mass of people taking to the streets i think it took you know about a couple hours anyway uh, for that to, to, to take place so over the past several weeks greg i know you had also written some uh, some tough editorials on on bill 96 but mark you've also been uh, spending some time writing about the bill as well it's been an eye-opening experience to find out just how far the government feels like they have to extend their tendrils into the lives of Quebecers. I looked up some numbers, uh, Greg, to your point earlier about the language and being in decline. In Quebec, 93% of people speak French. 93%. And what's the population of Quebec? It's it's 7 million people, roughly. So we're talking 5.6. what? 7 million people knowing French in some form or another. This is not a language that's in danger. This is political propaganda at this point. The government knows it did a disastrous job managing the COVID outbreak. And with an election on the way, all of a sudden, it's a classic Quebec political smokescreen. Because anytime the government mismanages something, oh, hey, look over here, we're we're doing something for nationalism and national values. And and, and the shift in, in how that's gone on in the last few years is troublesome, to say the least. Uh, This law you know, could take up to a year to go into effect. We we had this discussion earlier in the newsroom. And, you know, with the CGEP courses taking hold in 2024, this is rather urgent for a lot of people at this point. We had a, another discussion about court challenges being launched. Human rights lawyer Julius Gray has announced he will join in with uh, several other Anglo lobby groups, most of which are probably in the process right now of getting their, their challenges together, along with the Quebec Community Groups Network. And I think that the notwithstanding clause will probably not stand up in court. Well, well, and that's one of the things, right, that should be, people should be concerned about and it should raise tons of red flags. So, so under, under the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, uh, there's, there's, there's something known as a notwithstanding clause. So, so that's kind of like, uh, you know, it gives the powers of a province to say, well, for this reason, the notwithstanding clause shouldn't uh, should apply to this law, which means that somebody's human rights and freedoms can be violated for 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 re- for various reasons. It's very seldomly invoked, and under Bill ninety six, they're preemptively invoking it on various sections because the creators and crafters of this law know that it violates the rights of of English speakers in the province of Quebec. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt. Once more to your point, the use of the notwithstanding clause is is very, very seldom used. And they actually used it not that long ago on Bill 21, which is the uh, the secularism law, uh, the the quote unquote hijab law in Quebec, which is now being challenged in courts and will likely, I don't know, likely might be struck down in court. And we are probably going to see yet another challenge, notwithstanding clause, in court in the next two, three years. And what does that say about the government trying to pass all these laws that trample on people's rights? And, and at the same time, uh, you're looking at, at Bill 21 and, and, and Bill 96. And and what what it really is, is, is it, th- these are pieces of legislation against minorities, against people who are not pure land Quebecois and who are not Roman Catholic and and white. Yeah. There's this whole concept of separation of church and state that permeates just about every Western government. And there's a reason for it. However, Bill 21 and the Quebec government's take on it is something that that's that's far, far different. The whole thing is, is that they don't want 
people who their traditions and their religion and their values say a certain thing that's different than what the Roman Catholic and, and French Quebec values are. So people who, according to their traditions and their religion, wear face coverings or um, head coverings head, head, or headdresses yep. as a part of their way of life would now under this law not be allowed to do so if they work in the public sector. They also would not be allowed to show any religious symbols, including, you know, a cross. This is very hypocritical of the Quebec government, given the fact that every other town in Quebec is named Saint something or other. And right in the National Assembly, from its first time it was constructed, is a giant cross because Quebec is a Roman Catholic province. But because now people are emig immigrating to Quebec from various places in the world and bringing with them their knowledge, their, their customs, and their traditions. traditions and their way of life to the province to further enhance and diversify life in Quebec, it's very unnerving for people to see, oh no, the things that I've, I've known about are different and are changing and the, the values may, may not be the same. So, so no, we have to outlaw it. And, and it's frightening because to your point, it is incredibly hypocritical that the government is going to say, we are a secular state except for Roman Catholicism. We are a secular state. Re religion doesn't come into the public sphere unless of course it's our religion. You know, you look at a lot of different things have been done over the years in the name of church in, in this province and in, and across and in the Canada. world. And, you know, and the church as an organization, the Roman Catholic Church as an organization has permeated so many different walks of life. And the reason why South America speaks Spanish is because of the papal bulls and because of Pope back in the 1500s. And the reason why Brazil is the only South American country that, that speaks Portuguese is because the Pope arbitrarily drew a line on, on, the the map, America. Yep. On, on the map of the unknown world and said, this is for Spain. This is for Portugal. Mm -hmm. That's the only reason. So, you know, the, the, the church has been so involved in and, and so ingrained in a lot of Western civilization that people don't even realize it. But the church was so involved. It was way more involved in, in Quebec than anywhere else in the world until the quiet revolution of the 60s, mm -hmm. you know, 50s and 60s. And, and, and things have started to, to be separated a little bit more and become more secular. However... It's still ingrained in a lot of a, a lot of pure land Quebecois that the church is is above all else. If you go into this, if you go into any small town in Quebec, what's the center of town? The Catholic Church. Yeah. And has been for a generation. And that despite all the Not discussion. Not generation, generations. Generations. And any sort of, you know, reach to secularism has always sort of had that that aspect to it. And to your point the continuing permeation of the Roman Catholic church, you know, spurs a, a fear of the other. So we, we can go back to Ehuville in 2007, where, you know, they passed a charter of values in town that says, you know, we don't wear head coverings. And, and even though no Muslims, you know, came anywhere near the town ever, just because they were af afraid. I, but, but no head coverings, Unless you're a nun of the Roman right. Catholic Church. Exactly. And and so it smacks of, it's the highest of hypocrisies. And I mean, you know, we're, I'm not going to get into a debate over religions here or, or anything, but if people's beliefs are, are one thing and that's their way of life, you know, and, and for, for Quebecois, the Roman Catholic Church is, has been for centuries the be all and end all of things, right? And you know, I mean, you go back to the, to the Jesuits and, and creating missions uh, in, in Iroquois uh, territory mm -hmm. and all this and that. So it's a longstanding tradition among among Quebecois. And, you know, we're not going to talk about the church and things that it's done, but that's their belief system. And, and, and they think that's better than everybody else's and, and whatever. But if they want people to respect their way of life, respect is a two-way street. It's so a they, have, street. they have to be able to respect the beliefs and, and belief system, the religion and the ways of life of people they deem the other. And I love the, that you use the word respect because very often in Quebec, the word respect does not mean respect. It means obey. Yeah. And that's the thing. One of the fears about 
Bill 96 is the access to healthcare and all that and, and in a language that's, that's you're most com- comfortable with because healthcare could be a life and death situation. You know, in, in a world that did not, where Bill 96 does did not exist, it wasn't even a thought yet. Joyce Eshaquan went to the Joliet Hospital because she was, she was in a health crisis. And instead of getting the help that she needed to, that, that would have saved her life, she was ridiculed in French and the nurses that were responsible for her care were racist and made fun of her and let her die. So that was before bill 96. So now the government has essentially said to these people, go ahead with bill 96 becoming law. The, the fear is that there will be not just one more Joe Sashquan, but many Joe Sashquans. And it won't be just, indigenous women or indigenous people that are going to be suffering this could be anglophone people who are you know it could be anybody really and going to any hospital anywhere and and not being treated in the language that's, that they're most comfortable with in an emergency situation that's the fear quebec government says no 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 it's not the case but you know there's a misinterpretation going on but it's happened prior to bill 96 and 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 you know and I, will I, likely happen again yes we know that this is obviously being discussed uh, by chief and council at the uh, at the table. What are some of the discussions that are happening? I know you spoke to Grand Chief Gusanahawe Sky Deer recently, Greg. So I know that council has a bit of a, a plan moving forward in relation to how they're going to conduct further meetings with Quebec, if you will. In mid-May, Grand Chief Gusanahawe Sky Deer and one or two other council chiefs had a, a meeting that they thought was was very good and and could and, and could have bore bore fruit with Aboriginal Affairs Minister Ian Lafreniere and with the minister responsible for the French language, Simon jean Libert, about Bill 96 and about the community's concerns about it and looking for an exemption for, for our community members, especially, you know, uh, given CJEP uh, and, and the potential that could happen. The healthcare systems worries about it because, you know, at the end of the day, you know, we're looking at, you know, less people going, going for post-secondary education in Quebec, the less people that would be will likely be able to be hired at the Catamaran Hospital Center to care for a community. So that's a very definite threat to our community's healthcare system. So so they had this very high level meeting that that they thought could achieve anything. And, you know, less than two weeks later it was passed unanimously. Not unanimously, but unanimously by the, the CAQ government. The Liberals and, and the Parti Quebecois both voted against it, but for very different reasons. Liberals said it was uh, it went too far in trampling on rights, and the Parti Québécois said that it didn't go far enough in protecting the French language. So, so very, two very different reasons uh, for voting against. So, since then, since the bill passed, council issued a press release and uh, issued a statement saying that they're very disappointed that that this is that that the law the, the bill passed, though they're not surprised, but they they will now be ceasing any further discussions with the Quebec government. Until a high level meeting can happen between Council, MCK Grand Chief Gusnaw Sky Deer, and Quebec Premier Francois Legault about this issue and how we can move forward on it. So that's that's part of it. And Gusnaho is is saying that they're putting the relationship at a pause and uh wants to have this discussion. And because Neither she nor the late Grand Chief Joan Oren have had a face-to-face meeting with Legault. That's important to note. You know, really, it's not like nothing's really happening on that end. But there's all these discussions and, and different sectoral tables that council has been involved in with Quebec. You know, whether it be Transport Quebec, Justice, there, there's, you know, there's things on the Justice file as it pertains to the cannabis file in Ganawage and the Cannabis Control Board's permits for cannabis regulation that, they have to have discussions with the justice system in Quebec, the peacekeepers. You know, there's there's all these different things that they have had these tables, including a, the, a Quebec on Oahu relations table. So right now, all those talks are put on hold until they can get this meeting. And that's where we stand. And council said that they, they want to have the community heavily involved in their discussions. Uh, we've also said to to be on the lookout for because community meetings on this issue can be called at a drop of a hat and, you know, and, and, and are di- very different than the, the quarterly community meetings. So they're just asking for people to be on the lookout. And, and when when these meetings are called, as many people as can, uh, they're asking, asking to attend because they want to get have an accurate sense of, of what the community wants 
and what the community's wishes are in regards to this and how we can move forward so everybody's on the same page. And Mark, just sitting over here to my left side, you're getting a little antsy during our discussions. I was just curious to see if there was something that you were looking to add. I am having a lot of trouble with understanding how this law is going to differentiate between quote unquote historical Anglophones who have a school eligibility certificate and those who don't. Like if you call the Quebec government for a tax issue, are you going to have to show a school eligibility certificate over the phone? Like, And, and the other thing is under Bill 101 previously, if somebody's parents went to school in English, you were eligible to go to school in English without a permit. So there's people who are, you know, of a certain age now who never, who, who under Bill 101 did not require a permit to go to school in English. So now under, under Bill 96, they don't have this, the, 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 the historical standing appropriate yeah. permit, quote unquote, to, to be recognized as a historical Anglo. Mm-hmm. So, so that's a huge issue. So I don't get it. I don't understand how it's going to be enforced. And I, and I can't wrap my mind around how this is going to make the French language any stronger in Quebec. The, the, the premier also took aim at immigration this week. And I really, and I feel like these two uh, issues are inextricably linked because it, it also goes back to when Jolain Barrett had his press conference last week and, uh, and they were, they, he was, he was asked about why the government felt they needed to so strongly protect French. And his answer was the linguistic replacement theory that somehow French speakers are somehow being replaced in this province and connecting immigration to language and ethnic nationalism in this province frightens me to a degree you can't even understand. Our community is in a unique position, right? To understand that. And that's, that's the thing is, is that nobody here is against the French language and against the preservation of the French language. But the fact is the French language and Quebecois culture is not a threat. It's not in danger. And as a community, Ganawage and all the other indigenous communities in the province understand where they're coming from, but there's ways that you can enhance and promote the French language without being divisive. And that's what this law is, is, is divisive. It sets two levels of, of two classes of people. It has the Francophones above everybody else. And then Anglophones and allophones and indigenous people as second and third class citizens. And that's wrong. And one of the issues I think that needs to be addressed is yes. Simon Jean Barrett said that bill 96 does not affect indigenous people. It won't affect the, the, the preservation of their languages. And, you know, it's important that an official in the Quebec government has said that. However, it does affect our ability to get services in the languages that we're most comfortable with that from the service providers that can provide to us. These service providers don't speak Mohawk. They don't speak Cree. They don't speak Inuit. They speak English and French. If they're not allowed to communicate with us in English, then we're not going to get the services that we have the right to get. And that's, then that's a problem. That is a huge problem. So for all of our readers, listeners, and viewers, I would encourage you guys to keep in tune with your Diwizay because, of course, we will continue to bring you all the news as it relates to Bill 96. With that being said, Mark and Greg, I would like to thank both of you guys for coming in and chatting with me today and letting me pick your brain on this uh, very, very big issue. Now go. Thank you. Thanks for listening to The Lead. Be sure to check out our other podcasts like Meatheads and The Beating Table on Google and Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts.